To me, my X-Men. What are you doing watching cartoons at your age? Oh, Grandad, not this again. Yes, again, you should be out there looking for a job. What are you rolling your eyes for? This is coming from the same person who made me watch Lord of the Rings over a hundred times. Well, that's different. It's mature, it's complex, it handles deep themes and messages. So does this. <sighs> Look, just give the first episode a watch. It's only half an hour long. Well, it does sort of seem interesting, but just the one. X-Men 97 is a masterpiece. <sighs> Hello everyone and welcome to Rewind Reviews. Well, it's been a while since we've heard the phrase previously on X-Men. Yes, in this video we are taking a look at the highly anticipated revival of the iconic 90s animated show, X-Men 97. Released in 2024, season one of the revived Marvel Comics adaptation sees a band of mutants using their uncanny gifts to protect a world that hates and fears them. Here they're challenged like never before and forced to face a dangerous and unexpected new future. Created and co-written by Bo DeMaio alongside other episode writers Charlie Feldman, Anthony Saliti and directed by Chase Connolly, Emmy Yonimura and Jake Castorina, X-Men 97 features the voice talent of Ray Chase, Jennifer Hale, Cal Dodd, Matthew Waterson, George Boozer, Holly Chu, Lenore Zan, Alison Seeley Smith, JP Carliac, Ross Marquand, Guy Augustini, AJ Locasio, and Theo James. X Men the Animated Series. For a lot of people, it is considered to be the definitive adaptation of these characters. It was released in 1992 through to 1997 and came out as part of Marvel Entertainment's animated lineup. And that lineup included things like Spider Man, The Incredible Hulk, Iron Man, The Fantastic Four, and Silver Surfer. And even though my introduction to the world of the X Men and mutants in general was through the first live action movie from 2000, the TV show is what helped me understand and grow attached to these characters and that part of the Marvel Universe. It did become one of my favourite shows growing up and I've got a lot of fond memories of it. I'm revisiting the show not that long ago, outside of a few pop culture references and the overall quality of animation for a few of the seasons, I do think that overall it does still hold up quite well, and I would still say that it is one of the best interpretations of these characters. So when Marvel Studios made the announcement that they were going to be reviving the series and they were going to be continuing the story, I didn't really know how to feel. Not that I didn't think that Marvel could make a good series, they've made plenty of them over the years, but at the time of the announcement the MCU was in kind of a rocky place and there was a lot of theories and a lot of rumours that the animation style that they were going to go for was going to be more towards like a 3D sort of look that was quite similar to what it is that they use in What If, which I wasn't really on board with. But as time went on and more details were coming out about what it was that they were actually going to be doing in the show, my curiosity was definitely starting to increase. And then we got that first trailer and I will be completely honest, that won me over. It looked good and it got me excited for it. So release day came and I sat down to watch the first two episodes. Now I went into this show expecting just a fun throwback series to what the original series was to the 90s era that families could watch. I was not prepared for just how good this series actually turned out to be. And that continued from week to week with every episode that was getting released on Disney Plus and it continued to get better and better. To the point where now, after all 10 episodes of season 1 have been released, and I hand on heart, I'm not joking here, this is one of the best things to come from Marvel in the past few years, and it is one of the best animated series that I have seen in recent years. X-Men 97 picks up, I want to say a good several months or so after the final season of the original aired, where a dying Charles Xavier was taken away to the Shi'ar Empire by Lilandra to be healed. With Cyclops now the leader, the X-Men face a new series of challenges, including family drama, the appearance of the Goblin Queen, the UN's inclusion of Genosha, and Storm's confrontation with a haunting adversary, all amid a slew of old resurfaced enemies, conflicts and more, such as Mojo, Mr. Sinister, the Sentinels and the Friends of Humanity. But the new status quo is shattered by the return of Magneto, who, as it turns out, has been left everything that belonged to Xavier, including the X-Men, and that's on top of the appearance of a new threat that is poised to alter the course of mutant kind forever. So it's a pretty busy season. Luckily it's structured out like a proper TV series, with each episode featuring its own singular story, and it's all played out in an episodic format. But each episode features its own connective thread that ties together with the overarching plot, and all of those plot threads culminate in a pretty epic three-part finale. Plus, I love how it was able to 
to tie everything back to the original show and it features some excellent connections to even the earliest episodes that were broadcast back in 1992, it helps this show feel like a proper continuation of that story. It feels like it is part of that continuity and I love that. So I do think if you've never seen the original series, first of all, what are you doing? Go and see it and check out the other ones too. Anyway, if you have never seen the original series before, I do think that you are going to struggle with some elements of this series because it does require some prior knowledge of things that have happened in the past. But even so, it does try and fill you in as much as it can. It does try and prioritise what's going on here and now in this series. So I don't think that it is absolutely essential that you do need to see the original series in order to watch and enjoy this one. The biggest surprise for me when it comes to X-Men 97 is the stories that this season chooses to tell and adapt. The biggest ones include the family drama of Scott Summers and Jean Grey, Magneto's trial and inner conflict, Storm forced to confront her own demons, and Rogue going rogue. Now for the purposes of this video, I'm going to try my best to not go into any major spoilers for season one but I do need to address some big elements that do occur throughout this season so if you don't want to know anything about season one whatsoever I would stress caution. And with that out of the way let's continue. The first overarching story that I want to talk about is the one revolving around Cyclops and Jean Grey. I have never been a huge fan of these characters in the past even though I can't picture the X-Men team without them. This season and this might be a running theme throughout this video changed that. I not only got invested in their story and their relationship, but I genuinely cared about the characters. Jean Grey, voiced by voice acting royalty Jennifer Hale, gets one of the most twisted stories in this season as she's confronted with the return of Mr. Sinister, voiced by the always epic Chris Britton, and a new character that calls herself the Goblin Queen. It's not a story that I was particularly familiar with when it comes to the comics, but I was aware of who the characters were. But even so, this story and the impact that it continues to have on Jean Grey throughout the entire season really caught me by surprise. It's dark, it's emotional, it's got some really creepy imagery that feels like something directly from a horror movie and on top of that we also get to see a different side to Jean. I mean she still faints a lot but still I was really pleased with how they handled her this season. I loved what it is that they did with Madeline the Goblin Queen in Fire Made Flesh but I would have liked to have seen a little bit more from this story. A lot of it is condensed down into just the one singular episode so it does feel quite rushed even though they managed to do quite a lot in that one episode which is really impressive. I do think that we could have seen maybe just a little bit more. Maybe they'll do a little bit more with it in the future, maybe not. Who knows? We'll just have to wait and see. But for now, I really did like it. And kudos for telling a story about Jean Grey that doesn't revolve around the Phoenix. I appreciate that. And as for Cyclops, within a minute of his appearance within this show, he became awesome. I finally understand why it is that the comic book fans absolutely love this character and why it is that they don't like the adaptations that have appeared in the live action films. He's grown and developed away from being just a designated boy scout and he's become a very good tactician and leader while also now in this season becoming a father. Yes they actually pay off the cable plot from the original series in this season and they actually have him acknowledge his parentage. I genuinely love the direction they go with Cyclops, his characterization, the dilemmas he's faced with, the way he fights, the way he's grown, and combined with a stellar performance from Ray Chase. This is the best iteration of Cyclops I have ever seen and I can't wait to see what they do with him next. Now the Magneto storyline. I was very curious to see how it was that Magneto was going to factor into the overall plot of this series and it was the story elements that I was most looking forward to seeing play out and it did not disappoint. This version voiced by the incredible Matthew Waterson is easily the best version of Magneto that we have ever gotten. No dis respect to Ian McKellen or Michael Fassbender, both of them were absolutely fantastic, but this iteration of the character, the story that they were able to tell with him, goes much further than they've ever been able to do in the live action interpretations. Magneto, out of respect to his old friend, is trying to see the world through Xavier's eyes, even standing trial for his own crimes. And understandably so, the entire team is pretty suspicious about what it is that he's up to. I love how this story plays out. Yes, it has been done several times over the years, including the films, so you do know where it will most likely go, but it feels so much more impactful, emotional, and way more understandable too, to the point where you will find yourself wondering if Magneto is right all along. It even goes so far as to force all the main characters to choose between either joining Magneto or opposing him, and all of their choices make complete sense for each of those characters, and you do kind of find yourself siding with him as well. Magneto, in my opinion, is one of the best Marvel Comics characters that has ever been created and this show 
really highlights why. It is genuinely brilliant. It goes to some very dark, very mature places, and it is by far the most compelling story arc within this season. But just as compelling is what happens with Storm, voiced by the legendary Alison Seeley Smith. Storm as a character I don't think has ever really been done justice outside of the comics. I've always liked her as a character, but I've also always thought that they could have done a lot more with her. This fixes that. This is a fantastic version of Storm that not only gives her some meaty time in the spotlight, but it understands just how powerful she actually is. I think this is the first time that I've ever audibly heard her be referred to as an Omega level mutant, which is on par with Magneto. Her story in this goes to some pretty dark places with Storm having her powers taken from her, and while working alongside Forge, voiced by the brilliant Gil Birmingham, to get them back, she is forced to confront her own inner demons in the shape of this demonic owl looking creature called the Adversary. I'll be honest, I'd never heard of the Adversary before, and I'm still a little bit confused about what it actually was. And I'll be honest, when it first appeared, I thought that it was going to be this show's interpretation of the Shadow King. The nightmarish sequences that Storm is forced to go through in these two episodes, they did remind me a lot of what happened in Legion, so that's why it is that I thought that it might have been the Shadow King. On a side note, if you have never seen Legion before, give it a watch. It's set within the live-action X-Men universe, it's creepy, it's weird, it's funny, it stars Dan Stevens and Aubrey Plaza, it is brilliant. Anyway, I think the life-death story, while being a little bit rushed, is handled incredibly well, and the work that has been done with both Storm and Forge is absolutely fantastic. And that brings me on to the only gripe that I've seen from people who have watched this season, and that's the overall pace. I personally don't mind overall, but I do understand where people are coming from. Some stories, as I said, the stuff that they do with the Goblin Queen, with the life-death storyline, I do think that there is definitely a lot of room to actually do a little bit more with them. There is a very rushed pace with them overall. I do think that they could have expanded on some elements a little bit further. Both of those stories go at a breakneck speed and could have done with a little bit more time. But as I said, they do still manage to do a lot within their runtime to the point where you're still able to actively engage in the stories, in the characters, and you're able to follow everything that's going on. So I do think that maybe that is the one thing that they need to look into when it comes to season two and beyond. Maybe either having longer episode run times, or maybe splitting stories across two episodes. I feel like that might help a little bit more. It's a TV series that's an exclusive to a streaming service, so you do have a bit of flexibility when it comes to run times. So I don't really think there's any excuse not to. I mean, the last episode of this season is actually a lot longer than every other episode, so I think that's where they need to improve going forwards. All that being said, I think it's really impressive that despite some stories being a bit rushed, there's still plenty of time for character development and moments where the characters can just interact and have heartfelt discussions. Like between Jean and Storm, where the writers build off their already established relationship and turn it into a much stronger sisterly bond. And I even love that they give Nightcrawler and Rogue some time together too, which we didn't really get much of in the original show. The character work in general in this series is flawless. It understands who these characters are and it knows how to keep them both believable and, more importantly, human. Storm's story and development across this season is absolutely brilliant and it has made me a much bigger fan of the character now. And I'm big enough of a man to admit I I may have shed a tear or two, but not as much as I did during Rogue's story. If you've seen the show, you know why. Rogue has always been a favourite of mine ever since I watched the original series. I love her story, her backstory, her dilemma, the way that her curse is handled, and I love her personality. So I was really hoping that they would do something really fun and interesting with her in this series. And I really was not expecting where it was that they actually do go with her. Her story, which twists together with Magneto, Gambit and Nightcrawler, is one of the most powerful parts of this season. I was a bit confused about what they initially start with, as we see the history that Rogue has with Magneto, which really caught me off guard. But then seeing her conflicted feelings between Magneto and Gambit getting explored, and how that builds, and then when tragedy strikes the mutant population, and Rogue is caught up in the middle of it all, what they do with her from that point on is one of the most compelling and heartbreaking things in this entire show. And I've got to admit, it made me really frustrated with what it was that the films did with her. But let's not get into that. This is the best version of Rogue by a mile. The voice performance by Lenore Zan is phenomenal, arguably the best performance out of this entire series. She absolutely knocks it out of the park. I love the direction they go with her. I love how they dig into her curse of not being able to touch anyone, even though they have access to mutant inhibitor collars, which would fix that in an instant. I had to mention it. You could even get forced to turn it into a bracelet 
Lancer or a ring or something a little bit more compact. Anyway, I really love how she lives up to her name and I love that they let her off a leash and she just demolishes anything in her way. Seeing her just laying into a character called Bastion voiced by Theo James was so satisfying. It gave me goosebumps. I am genuinely happy with what it is that they do with Rogue in this show and I hope that that continues into season two. Mentioning Bastion, I'll be honest, He's not really a character that I was really that familiar with. I didn't know who he was, I didn't know his background, his origin story, anything like that. I kind of recognise him, so I do think I have seen him somewhere before. But even so, the fact that this is a new antagonist that gets very firmly established, the impact that he has on the team is genuinely felt, and the fact that he gets built up as a proper, dangerous, worldwide threat all while still being sympathetic and his motivations clear is really impressive. He is a fantastic character and has a fantastic voice performance from Theo James. What this writing team has been able to do with these characters is genuinely incredible. All of them get a few moments to shine and all of their personalities are very well defined. And that's even during some of the faster paced episodes. Gambit was always one of my favourites from the original show and while he does get a little sidelined, he is still great. His voice is better than ever. Courtesy of AJ Le Casio. And the Raging Cajun gets one of the most epic and heartbreaking scenes of the entire show that you will absolutely remember. I still haven't really recovered from it, to be honest. I was pretty surprised how Jubilee, voiced by Holly Chu, is handled, and it made a nice change letting her get some time in the spotlight as she becomes maturer, turning 18, and even taking on a kind of guide role for newcomer Roberto, aka Sunspot, voiced by Guy Augustini, with some nice parallels to her first appearance in the original show. And even characters like Beast, Nightcrawler, Bishop, and even more off voiced by George Boozer, Adrian Hoff, Isaac Robinson-Smith, and J.P. Karliak. They may not have very prominent roles in this season, but you are still invested in their characters. Nightcrawler especially, who feels way more energetic and fun than he did in his original appearance, and he gets some really heartfelt monologues. To be fair, the dialogue in general throughout this entire show is amazing. I was curious with what it was that they were going to do with Xavier in this season, even though I wasn't even sure if he was even going to show up or not. He does, and even though his importance is really relegated to the second half of the season, I do really like what it is that they do with him. It's different to what we normally see from Charles Xavier, as this does highlight his flaws much more. But I like how the foundations of him and his relationship with his former students, Lilandra and Magneto, are dove into much further. His voice, provided by Ross Marquand, I'll admit, took some getting used to. I feel like this is probably the most noticeably different voice from the original, but even so, I think Ross manages to do a fantastic job of blurring together his impression of the original voice actor Cedric Smith and adding his own spin on it. I think it works overall, and I think that Ross was a brilliant choice to take over. Now, have you noticed that I haven't really mentioned Wolverine yet? Yeah, Wolverine takes a little bit of a back seat throughout this season, despite featuring quite prominently in both the marketing and the merchandise. And you know what? And speaking as a Wolverine fan, I don't mind that. It's awesome seeing him again, and great hearing Cal Dodd's growling voice again, and he does get some pretty cool sequences where he actually does get to properly use his claws. But Wolverine not getting that much focus is a really great decision because for years it's always kind of felt like he was always the central character whenever it was that we got an X-Men story, which I do understand because he is arguably the most recognisable and popular mutant. But having him taking a back seat in this series allows for the other characters to get a lot more focus and attention, and I love that. It makes this feel more like a team and highlights their dynamic rather than prioritising any singular story or character. Apparently when Bo DeMaio, the showrunner, was actually pitching this show to Marvel Studios, one of the first things that he actually did say about it was that he wanted to prioritise the X-Men team rather than just a character like Wolverine. And I do understand that there are going to be a lot of Wolverine fans that are going to be quite disappointed in this. I've seen some people being quite frustrated with it online. But let's not forget that this year, Wolverine is going to be getting his own movie with Hugh Jackman back in the lead alongside Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool and he's even going to be wearing his yellow suit. Why be disappointed with the lack of Wolverine within the series when that is what we are going to be getting this year? It was the right decision and I am happy that they made it. This really does feel like the X-Men. It understands who each of these characters are and it knows what it is that each of these characters can bring to the table. It treats the X-Men like both a team and a found family at the same time and it balances out the dynamic between each of these characters really well and very believably. The main themes and the core of this team and these stories 
are maintained and carried over from the original series and the comics, and they are woven into this story in a very natural way. But because this show is aimed at a slightly older audience, they're able to treat the themes of acceptance, otherness, racism, homophobia, bigotry, and isolation even more maturely and deeper than the original show ever could. And given how the world is now, it means that the writers do add a slightly more modern viewpoint on these stories whilst also keeping it very firmly in the 90s. It's a really hard balancing act to do that, but they've absolutely nailed it. And yet, it still manages to be a lively, fun, colourful, action-packed comic book adaptation. This is the purest form of the X-Men 2 date, and this is by far the best adaptation of these characters. And that absolutely goes for both the designs and the costumes for each of the characters. It goes without saying that the overall look and costumes for the returning characters are absolutely perfect. The colours really pop on screen, they help differentiate the characters well, and I actually quite like the updates as well. These are pretty much the exact same looks that the characters had in the original show, but there are some differences here in there, especially hairstyles. I'll be honest, I've never really been a big fan of the mohawk look that Storm has in the comic books, but I've got to be honest, actually seeing it within this show, actually seeing it within motion with the different costumes actually actually does have within this series, I actually thought it did look kind of cool overall, and it really did grow on me. But I really like a lot of the new looks and a lot of the new character designs as well. I kind of knew that the team were going to be getting new suits by the end of the series, but I'll be completely honest, based on the stories that they were telling within this series, I did think that the costumes were going to be adaptations of the costumes that appeared in the Grant Morrison run. Nope, they get to don their original suits, including Jean Grey sporting her Marvel Girl suit. Wolverine gets his brown and orange tights, Jubilee gets a cooler and updated yellow and black look, and Storm gets her classic black and gold suit. They all look absolutely incredible, and I love the decision to give them all new costumes. I was a little bit conflicted about Magneto's new look, the sleeveless one that he's got with a gigantic M on his chest. I know it is a look that does exist within the comics, but I've never really been a big fan of it, to be honest. I'm still a little bit split on it, to be honest, but I love that during the Tolerance is Extinction three-part finale that he does get to don his classic red and purple armour. That made me happy. Even the villains, the minor characters, a lot of the new characters like Bastion, like Sunspot, like the Goblin Queen, the mutants that do feature throughout this series, the cameos that appear, they all look absolutely fantastic, and I love seeing a lot of these classic looks again. Especially one of the cameos, which I won't spoil for you, but all I'll say is, if you are somebody who watches this channel, if you're somebody who knows me, then you probably are aware how much that appearance meant to me. That was special. I was kind of worried about how it was that they were going to handle the cameos that do appear within this series, but honestly, I needn't have feared. The characters that do appear, they are used very well, they aid within certain stories, their appearances make sense, and they help establish everything else that's going on within the world at this point in time. I love what it is that they have done with the designs overall for the characters, for the vehicles, for the backgrounds, for the sets. I love how they have stuck with the original designs and they haven't just kind of MCU-ified everything. I know Kevin Feige at one point did consider actually making this show a part of the MCU, but I am so glad that he didn't. It works so much better as its own thing and I'm so happy with that decision. And I do appreciate the little dig that they throw into this aimed at the leather costumes that the characters wore in the films. You actually go outside in these things? What would you prefer? Yellow spandex? Am I going to war or a circus? What do you expect? Black leather? Keeping the designs of these characters simple is a really good decision, especially when it comes to animation. And in terms of the animation within this series, the overall quality of it is absolutely flawless. As I said, I was a little bit worried about what it was that they were going to be doing with the animation style within this series, because I had heard rumours that they were going to be using the same style that they used for What If? But thankfully, it isn't. I don't mind the art style that they have gone for within that show, but I don't think that it would work for this. It mixes together a variety of 2D and 3D effects to help bring these characters Characters to life. It's blurred together really well and shaded correctly, so it is hard to spot the 3D. The only time the 3D animation is noticeable is during the end credits. But the 2D animation that they have used in this series, it is fluid, it is highly detailed, and it looks incredible. I'd even say that compared to the original show, the overall quality is a big improvement, and it looks so much better as well. I mean, the budget probably helps. I love how the characters' abilities are realised with the scale and weight perfectly captured while still looking like the comics. There's even some shots and sequences that are literally page to screen adaptations and it's awesome seeing some of those scenes brought to life. I know it's not everyone's favourite episode but Motendo was really well crafted where we see Jubilee and Roberto sucked into an old arcade game run by Mojo and a good chunk of this episode is done in the style of a 16-bit video game. That was cool. I do reckon that the animators or the writers that were working on this series 
are fans of those games and especially the Marvel vs. Capcom ones because there are sequences during some of the big fights and some of the bigger action sequences where some of the characters, some of the poses and some of the actual moves that they make are directly from those games. And it's not just video games that have an influence on this series, other movies and TV shows as well. Like there is actually a sequence in this series that is very clearly, and they have openly said, was inspired by the first flight sequence in Man of Steel. And that was a really great scene as well. And I love that the art style and animation that they have gone for within this series is flexible enough that the writers and the animators are able to explore different tones and genres whilst having it still very firmly being set within the 90s. And because of how fluid the animation is in this series, it makes the action sequences so much more entertaining and they are absolutely spectacular. There's some amazing fights and set pieces in this and because the show is allowed to be darker and more grown up the violence also gets ramped up a little bit too it doesn't go too far though it is i would say rated a 12 but even so it does push that rating as far as it can go and there are some shockingly brutal scenes in this. It's also cool just seeing the characters teaming up and combining powers to help each other out, like Gambit charging up Wolverine's claws, and my favourite, seeing Wolverine teaming up with a sword-wielding Nightcrawler. That was awesome. The stuff they can do with Nightcrawler in this compared to the films is so much more energised and quicker, and I love that shot where Wolverine gets dragged through a Banff portal and it's so trippy and cool. It's just... Oh, I just I genuinely just can't get over just how good this series turned out. It gives you everything you could want and more and it still finds ways of surprising and shocking you. I absolutely loved it. And finally, I can't do this review without mentioning the soundtrack from the Newton Brothers. They really stepped up to the plate here and provided a suitably epic soundtrack that mixes together old and new themes. It sounds incredible and it helps service everything that is going on screen, including several new character themes. The best one, in my opinion, is the theme that they've created for Storm which sounds amazing and of course that iconic theme music that they use in the opening titles which the Newton brothers have kind of remixed a little bit and tweaked here and there but it is still pretty much the exact same theme. It is absolutely fantastic and it is still one of the greatest superhero animated TV show themes ever made. It's woven into the overall soundtrack throughout this series and I like how it is utilised overall. It instantly sets the mood and it gets you pumped up for what's going to happen. Also, I think they've done an excellent job of recreating the opening title sequence, which is almost a shot for shot recreation with a few new clips added in too. And I also think that it's a really nice touch that in each episode, the opening title title sequence actually changes a little bit here and there and there's a few clips that may hint at what's going to factor into the episode that it is featured in and it also sort of gives you a few clues about what previous events may tie into it. That was a really smart decision, I really like that overall. The soundtrack for season one is brilliant overall and I'm really looking forward to hearing what it is that the Newton brothers create for season two. Overall, this is one of, if not the best thing to come from Marvel in years. It is a phenomenal show that highlights the best of these characters and tells some fantastic and compelling stories that stay true to the original show and feel like natural progression. The work done with each of these characters and the fact that each of them gets a good amount of time to shine is brilliant and that also goes for the villains too. Yes, some characters don't get as much screen time but that may change as we head into season two and beyond. And yes, we are getting a season two, a season three and more. And I hope it's able to maintain the quality that this season has established. Where I think this season could improve is more with the overall pace of some episodes. As I said, some episodes could be a little bit longer or more episodes used to tell stories as some things do feel a tad rushed. And that's it. I have basically no other complaints about this show. The animation, the voice work, the style and artwork, the music, the tone, the sound design, the stories and the character development is, and excuse the pun, excellent. This is, in my opinion, a must-watch show. Casual viewers, fans of the original series, the films and the comics, please have a look at this show. Yes, some prior knowledge may be required, but you are still able to follow what happens and the characters and story are engaging enough that you do want to know more. I absolutely love this season and I can't wait to see where it goes from here. So with all that being said, my rating for season one of X-Men 97 is a 9 out of 10. That's really just an overall rating of the entire series. Individual episodes it is genuinely a coin toss between 9s and 10s. So it's really more like a 9.5 out of 10, even though I don't do half marks. That's how good this show is. Everything that has gone into making this series what it is, every single person involved, honestly, 
take a bow. I'm really excited about what it is that they are going to do with season two and who it is that they are going to be bringing in. Plus, I do kind of agree with the majority of the fan base that I do think that Marvel Studios should look into maybe reviving some of the other animated shows. I reckon they could do a good job, but we'll see what happens. Well, I think I've gone on long enough about this season. I really don't know how long this video is going to be. If you're still here, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoy this content, please like and subscribe and be sure to hit the notification button to keep up to date on everything that is going on on here. If you have seen X-Men 97, let me know down in the comments what you think about it and which episode is your favourite. If you can, I can't. Plus, if you have any suggestions for any future rewind reviews you would like to see me do, let me know down below. But until then, thank you very much for watching and I shall see you in the next video. See you guys.